finding their seat. This is August in Houston. That means everybody is somewhere else, hopefully, where it's cooler. School's about to start. All right, the, um, just <clears throat> the only announcement I have is a men's prayer breakfast and deacons meeting will be on August the 18th. So guys, try to think about inviting someone to come uh, to join us on that, that Saturday morning. It's an opportunity for us to get to know each other in the congregation as well as to uh, talk about what we're reading in our Bibles and to uh, discuss the scripture together. All right. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we need to make sure that we are in right relationship with the Lord. I hope that you have been enjoying your fellowship with the Lord today and that it has been increasing and that whenever it is broken that you have taken the appropriate steps to make sure that you recover that ongoing rapport with the Lord, that dynamic is necessary for our spiritual growth. So we always take time to confess sin before we begin, a time of silent prayer. A confession should be uh, just between you and the Lord. And so we will uh, have a few moments of silent prayer to give each one the opportunity to make sure you're in right relationship with the Lord. And then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, it's such a privilege we have to come together, privilege because of your grace, a privilege because you uh, did everything necessary to provide salvation for us, a remarkable salvation, multifaceted, complex beyond anything that we can imagine, and yet simple so that we can understand the good news and trust in Christ as Savior. Our Father, we're thankful that uh, we can be here tonight. We know that there are a number of folks who are usually here that are traveling this week. We pray for their safety. We pray that their time away will be a time of refreshment. And Father, we pray that they can return to us safely. We also remember those in the congregation who are uh, sick. Some uh, have face surgery, some are facing surgery. We pray for friends of the congregation like Pastor Mark Perkins and his uh, fight with leukemia, and we pray that, you, pray that you would strengthen his body and that it would respond to this bone marrow transplant and that you would uh, give him the, the strength and recovery needed to get back into the pulpit to teach, as well as for Freddie Cortez out in Southern California recovering from a stroke. We pray that you would uh, provide the strength uh, for him and as, he, as both of these men go through these tests of suffering that they might uh, learn much with which they can edify the body of Christ. Now, Father, we pray for us that as we continue our study, coming to understand what it means to honor you, to worship you, to glorify you, that we may get out of ourselves and focus our attention on you who created everything and you who are our Redeemer and our Savior and the one with whom we anticipate eternal fellowship and eternal joy. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we have been studying about worship. We are in a study for those who may be tuning in or listening just uh, randomly. This is a series in 1 Samuel, but I am doing a sub-series that I anticipated would be about six or eight weeks, and it may turn into six or eight months. Sometimes the Lord just guides and directs that way, and I think this is an important topic. In the course of our study of 2 Samuel, 
we came to that point in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when David is taking the ark into Jerusalem. And the account in 2 Samuel is rather abbreviated compared to the three chapters devoted to it in 1 Chronicles chapters, I think it's around chapter 14, 15, and 16, the central chapter being chapter 15. And there we see that David is expanding what Israel is doing as part of corporate worship. We don't see that this is a response to any direction from God per se, but we see that this is David acting on behalf of his own uh, understanding of God's plan and purposes for Israel, his understanding of uh, what God is going to do through Israel. And so I think there may have been some revelation in the past, or at least an understanding that there would be a central sanctuary. Now, where would David get the idea that there would have to be a central sanctuary, that where everyone in Israel would would have to worship? Well, first of all, he would get it from the fact that God established a central sanctuary in, uh, in the tabernacle, God's mobile home, during the time that they're in the wilderness until a permanent structure would be established. Also because there is much said about Israel bringing their offerings and their sacrifices and their tithes to a central sanctuary in Deuteronomy. So if you're studying and thinking and reflecting on the scripture, then you would be thinking, well, where is this central sanctuary? What can we do to uh, glorify God in moving from this temporary structure, which had probably been somewhat made somewhat permanent while it was in Shiloh or Shiloh. And during that time the of almost four centuries, the ark was there in the tabernacle. And then we went through this horrible period during the end of the period of the judges, during the time of Samuel, when the uh, Israelites were defeated by the Philistines, the ark was captured, the ark goes through this little journey as the Philistines think that they can um, have a big pep rally because they defeated the God of Israel. In the end, God is des- destroys their uh, great idol to Dagon in their temple, and it brings much uh, disease and suffering upon the Philistines during that time. And finally, they said, we're, we're done with this. We're going to send the ark back to Israel. The ark comes back to Israel, and now David is bringing it to Jerusalem. So when he does that, and initially there is a tremendous error that takes place. They don't follow the directions of the Mosaic Law. They don't carry the ark properly. They don't have the right people carrying the ark. And as a result, when this ox cart carrying the ark hits a pothole, uh, the ark wobbles, and the uh, one of the priests Uzzah, Uzzah reaches out to stabilize the ark. The God doesn't need man to stabilize him, and so Uzzah is struck dead instantly, and this really shakes up David because this is supposed to be this huge celebration. And boom, you have a a death of the priest, and so they stop. They put the ark into temporary storage while David goes back to determine what they've done wrong. And as a result of his study and reflection on the Torah and all that is within Deuteronomy and the other books, he decides what must be done. They correct their procedure, but he enhances this. And we see this incredible... uh, just profound, robust change to the worship of Israel. And that's the result of David coming face to face with the majesty, the power, and the holiness of God. So we traced our steps as we looked at some of the other times when there was a face to face encounter with God, specifically Isaiah chapter 6, to see 
what we could discern about worship in these passages. And what it tells us is that worship is something that is not trivial. It is not to be thought of as something that is a part, a part of our daily life in the sense that it is just like everything else in life, just something else that we do. But it is seen from the very beginning of Scripture as this incredibly focused time when the profane, and what profane means isn't profanity, Profane means that which is common, that which, which relates to everyday life and everyday activities, that that is set aside because we're coming together as a body of believers to focus on the God who created everything. And, and that means to fully grasp that, we have to have, I think, a much more robust and profound understanding of what God did to create everything, to call into existence that which did not exist. In a complete vacuum of non-existence, suddenly there was existence. There was was, uh, inorganic matter, and God then, over a period of six uh, consecutive 24-hour days during the creation week, uh, which we believe is a a recreation after the fall of Satan, God is restoring the planet for the habitation of man, and everything that is done is unique to God. And we've looked at the fact that the primary word that is used for God's creative activity is the Hebrew word bara, which doesn't mean ex nihilo or uh, ex nihilo creation or creation out of nothing. But it has the idea of, of that only God can do this because no human ever is said to create with the use of that verb. Only God can bara. So this is something that is as profound. And all of this builds in the majesty of God. And we see that there is a, an architectural blueprint and plan to creation as, as we work through Genesis chapter 1. And as we look at what happens and what God has provided in the garden, which is where we are now, this lays the groundwork for understanding various themes and threads that run from Genesis 1 and 2 all the way to Revelation 21 and 22. And that there is this broad panorama that we've been studying that is inherent to developing within each of us a greater understanding of what worship is because we have a greater understanding of the complexity and the majesty and the power and the authority of God. So we're looking at this. We're continuing to look at uh, Genesis chapter 2 and 3. We're actually going to get to chapter 3 tonight chapter 4 next week. From there it moves faster, but this it, we have to lay this, this a lot of this groundwork. We defined worship as the celebration of eternal fellowship with a sovereign and holy triune God. A celebration, it can be rejoicing in an exuberant manner, or a celebration can also be a very sober, quiet, Reflection. As Americans, we have trouble with quiet. I was, um, as I've been doing study on on worship, one of the things that I ran across is that in the early church, in the I think it was in about the third to fourth century, one of the uh, great early church fathers. He's not always that great, but he's considered great. His he was called. Chrysostom, uh, which means golden mouth. He was a little anti-Semitic. There were a few other problems with his theology along the way, but we can't be too picky about uh, the early church fathers because they had not developed much of an understanding of, of a lot of theology yet. They were still working it through, and so we can Uh, quibble about a number of things. Many of them still thought you had to be baptized in order to be saved. They just hadn't sorted all these things out yet. They didn't even have the word uh, Trinity until 
uh, late in the second century. So how can you have a clear understanding of a triune God if you don't have the vocabulary and the clear definition for it? So it, it's during that period that you run into this, but, but in the course of um, the development of worship in the early church, one of the things that they developed was uh, a form of liturgy. And I'll get some examples together as we go forward in this, because I think there's elements of this that we can learn from. But in uh, one of the uh, liturgies that Chrysostom developed in the early church, there is, it's a call to prayer. And the problem, if you've ever been in a liturgical church service, it moves way too fast. You know, the, the person leading it says something and then the congregation responds and then the, the one leading it says something and the congregation responds. And in this particular liturgy, each area had to do with different areas of prayer. But the way in which that was done in the early church is that the, the one leading it would, say, would start off saying something, we praise the, the name of the creator God of the heavens and the earth and the seas. And then it would be followed by silence. Maybe one or two or three minutes of silence because the people are to respond by prayer and thinking through what they know about God as the omnipotent creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is. And then something else would be stated, uh, giving thanks for our redemption through Christ on the cross. And that would be followed by a minute or two of silence. But see, we're very uncomfortable with silence. You come into church and all of a sudden somebody stops talking and everybody starts looking around and, and becoming uncomfortable. And, and, but that was an opportunity for people to enter into a, a responsive uh, participation in worship. Worship isn't meant, corporate worship isn't, always, isn't meant to always be a uh, spectator uh, activity. There's to be a response on the part of those who are in the congregation. So there are different times and different ways in which the church has practiced that. So it's, it, it can be a very formal and a very sobering celebration. I can say this every time because we tend to think of the word celebration only in terms of like celebrating uh, something joyous and happy, happy new year or Christmas presents or w something like that. But when we have a funeral, we also celebrate the life of a person, but it is a much more sobering and reflective time. So that's why we use that word celebration. And we do that by focusing on and adoring God and his character, his works, and second, the express commitment of trust and obedience. So there's that's part of the response, maybe uh, audibly, maybe not, in the congregation, and remembering God's work of salvation and what he's provided for our uh, spiritual growth. So in the previous lessons, we've seen that worship practices are often influenced by worldview, and we're going to get to this more in the next few weeks. As we see the post-fall world, there is a constant counterfeit of worship. It is a battle throughout the scripture. It is a battle for those who are not believers because they have uh, corrupt views of God. They develop uh, idol idolatrous systems, uh, polytheistic systems, um, pantheistic systems, and their worship becomes extremely extremely corrupt, but that external corruption also influences the people of God, and so they're constantly needing to fight against assimilation to the worldview of the culture at the day, and usually it hasn't been a winning battle, unfortunately. Second thing we've seen is that uh, we began to look at key teachings in the theme of strict scripture, tracing the dwelling of God or his sanctuary among God's people. 
and uh, developing that, which we did a little more last week in uh, as our, our looking at the Gospel of John and ending up with 1 Corinthians 3.16. And seeing that the tabernacle or temple is patterned after a heavenly archetype, it's not just in the past, it looks forward to the future because the tabernacle or temple is built on a heavenly archetype and there will not be a physical temple, which means a dwelling place, a physical temple on the earth because in the new heavens and new earth, God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit live on on planet earth with his creatures so that the whole planet becomes a temple for God. Okay, we came to look at the fact that Eden has three areas. You have, well, the earth at the time of Eden, you have the whole earth, then you have the area of Eden, then an inner area, uh, which is the sanctuary of God, the garden itself and that after the fall it will be guarded by cherubs. The tabernacle depicts that. You have the outer courtyard, you have cherubim woven into the tapestries, uh, indicating that, 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 reminding us that we're prevented from entering into the presence of God. You have the holy place and the holy of holies. Uh, in both tabernacle and temple. So we're going to talk more about this, especially today. Tonight we're going to be looking at the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've talked about the fact that in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of God described in Ezekiel 28, there's gold and precious gems that are mentioned. They're mentioned also in Genesis chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden. They will be present in the future new heavens and the new earth. Uh, this is actual, it's literal, but it also depicts the richness of God's blessing for man. He provides so much in all of its beauty and all of its abundance. We talked last time looking at John chapter 4 and John chapter 7, how the New Testament shows the fulfillment of the river of life uh, sim symbolism in the, in the Old Testament. Today we're going to look at, uh, if we can, we're going to try to pull the last four together. Primarily we're looking at the trees, how that's depicted in the tabernacle and temple, and ultimately where that's fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth. Last time we looked at the living water issue that in the Psalms there's the talk about that God provides a river under the tabernacle that refers to the Gihon spring and that we also saw that there's a storage area deep a spring under there that when Jesus returns the temple our Mount of Olives rather will split there will be this gush of fresh water that will restore the Dead Sea part of it flows east to the Dead Sea, the other part flows west to the Mediterranean. It will completely change the topography of, of Jerusalem. But Jesus points out that the fact of literal living water is a picture of eternal life. And he tells the woman at the well that if uh, she knew who he was, she would ask him and he would give her living water. So this is a representation of eternal life. Water is necessary for life, and so uh, that is a picture of eternal life. In John 4.14, uh, he tells her, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life. And then he adds to that, he gives meaning to that. By the time you get to John 7, he sa says at the um, Feast of Tabernacles, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Another invitation to come to him. And drinking is another picture, as we saw even on Sunday morning. To drink of him is equivalent to believing on him, to accepting him, to internalizing his message that he is the Messiah who will die on the cross for us. And he makes it clear that this idea of drinking 
is then specifically explained as he who believes in me. So drinking is a picture of accepting Christ. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now the idea here uh, is a fulfillment of passages in Isaiah 12, 3, uh, the wells of salvation it uses the same imagery. Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Salvation is free, it's at no cost. And when Jesus is, talks in John 3, 7, 38, when you believe in him, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We ask, what does that mean? And in verse 39, he says, that we're told by John, this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. So we're given the Holy Spirit. We're told he's not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified, implying that once Jesus was glorified, the Spirit, uh, the Spirit would be given. And the idea here is not that the Spirit flows out of believers to other believers, uh, we're not the source of the Spirit for others, but that when the Spirit of God is working within our lives, when we are walking by the Spirit, then the Spirit is producing fruit in our lives, according to Galatians 5, 16 down to 23, and that when we are walking by the Spirit, we are satisfied spiritually in our uh, immaterial nature in our soul and spirit. We're satisfied. Uh, we understand who God is. We are dependent upon him, that the spirit is bearing fruit in our lives. And the result of that is, or part of the result of that is that that, that then enables us to be a testimony to others to what Christ has done for us. We saw last time that this is related to the fact that we are made a temple for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 6, 19. So now we come to the next element that's in the Garden of Eden, and that's the trees. There are many, many trees in the garden. There are trees of all manner of fruit in the garden to provide for mankind. It's the most luxurious, beautiful, fruitful, bountiful garden uh, on all of the earth. It is the special abode of God where he has placed those who are in his image. And there's a lot that goes on there, as we'll see that uh, mankind, man and woman, male and female, are both created in God's image, and they are there in this special place with God. This is the sanctuary that is set apart from the rest, uh, uh, the rest of the planet. And so um, we see that ideas of that, once it is lost, that the reality of that garden uh, continues to be present in the thinking of the human race and that there are two trees among all these beautiful trees and in this special garden where God lives uh, there are two special trees described in Genesis 2 9 and out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So these two trees are present. We talked about the water representing the river of life. Well, the tree also, the tree of life also uh, pictures uh, life. And so the idea of a garden, which is where God dwelt, the idea of a special sacred tree, all of these are ideas that get corrupted over time in the in the ancient world uh, Genesis excuse me Romans uh, 1 uh, 18 and following talk about how man rejects and I think there's a historical element to that description how we reject 
the nonverbal testimony of God. We suppress the truth in righteousness, and the creature begins to worship the Creator, and professing to be wise, they become fools. And so that whole section talks or summarizes about the development of, of idolatry. And this is what happens uh, very quickly in the antediluvian, that is the pre-flood period on, on the earth. But we see that these ideas continue in somewhat distorted ways down through uh, human history. It's the corrupt influence of human thinking. We, we get fed this line that everything evolves from the simple to the complex and that religion evolves from uh, spiritism and animism to uh, pantheism and then polytheism and eventually uh, develops into uh, monotheism. And what the Bible says is, no, that, that's all wrong. That's typical paganism. In the Bible, God creates everything perfect. Every creature initially is a monotheist. Adam and Eve are monotheists. And it's only as sin corrupts the thinking of man that everything deteriorates. But in, as man begins to invent his own religions and his own worship, there are certain ideas that are common in almost every religion. There's no culture that doesn't have some idea of sacrifice. Where in the world did that come from? That every culture in the world would believe in sacrifice. You have other ideas uh, that are present. For example, you have various flood myths that the earth is destroyed by flood, God chooses somebody special, and th due to their efforts, uh, animals are, are rescued and people are rescued. It varies according to the culture and the time, but the Assyrian or Babylonian myth about the flood is called the Gilgamesh epic. And in the Gilgamesh epic, which talks about the original creation, the dwelling place of God is in a place, it's in a garden. It is a place that is completely surrounded by trees. It's uh, said to be a mountain. We saw that there's a reference to a mountain in Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, it's referred to in the Gilgamesh epic as a mountain of cedar. It's the dwelling place of all of the gods. And if you think biblically that, that we have one God and all of these angels in, in the corruption of paganism, the angels become the gods who are, and the demons become the gods who are um, the, the fallen angels who then uh, get involved with the uh, marrying, uh, taking human wives in Genesis chapter 6 and many uh, many other things, but you see this idea of a garden that is incomparable. You see the fact that there is there's a sacred tree. Uh, other pagan myths also mention the idea of a sacred tree that gives healing and life-giving powers. And there's even reference in some of these myths to the fact that this garden is located between the mouths of two rivers. So that's a perversion of the description in Scripture that one river comes out of Eden and splits into four. In the ancient Near East, so we're talking about the cultures that surround Israel. Remember when Moses writes this for the Israelites, writing down their, or it, 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 Genesis is about where the Jews came from. When he's writing this, they are about to go into the most perverse culture in all in almost in history, as they have uh, perverted uh, sexuality, they have perverted uh, many different things. It's a horrible uh, religion that involved infant sacrifice and child sacrifice and all kinds of things. And they have created their own set of, of, of myths. And one of the things that you would find prevalent in many of the surrounding cultures was the idea of the importance of trees. And they would worship in groves of trees. And they would depict gods like the Asherah, like the, God, the fertility goddess, with a pole, a tree. And so where did they get this idea of a tree? And sometimes you, you even have a depiction of the fertility goddess by a serpent. And in uh, one of the Canaanite groups, 
the uh, that was dis- uh, it was discovered that the fertility goddess is named Chavat, which is etymologically related to Chava, which is the name for Eve in Hebrew. So there's this perversion, this mix-up. You got a serpent, you got a tree, you got a woman, and all of this gets mixed up and comes out rather perverted in uh, in these pagan. Uh, pagan cultures. And so the uh, trees, of course, are, are important because a grove of trees, if you see a grove of trees, you know there must be water there. Uh, in Texas, one of the first things I learned when I was a uh, young man camping was if you want to find a spring, you look for sycamore trees or fig trees because they need a good um, water source that's always, always there. And so they, the, uh, these pagans would see a grove of trees and they would believe that the local god who was called Baal, which simply means Lord, but it comes to be the name of the primary deity for water, for thunder, for storms, for lightning, for fertility uh, in the Canaanite religion. And they would believe that the Baal inhabited those groves and Asherah was his consort. So... Uh, a lot of times what we read in the Pentateuch are simply details that are included in order to count to be a counterpoint to the pagan uh, pagan religions uh, in, in, in so, some ways God's sort of sticking his thumb in their eyes uh, he's poking them in the eye because uh, uh, he's constantly making fun of these fake religions that are you know, carving up a tree, they cut down a tree, they cut off half of it and go burn it in the fire, and they take the other half and carve it up and worship it. And so he's, he makes fun of, of those things. But in the Canaanite religion, we learn about, um, we've learned from various texts that we've discovered, for example, in a place called Ugarit, sometimes referred to as Tel Rashamra up in Syria, They discovered what's known as the Rashamra text, and it just describes how perverted the religion is and the the sacrifice, the the priests and priestesses that were uh, temple prostitutes. And and the idea was that that you would go in and have uh, and copulate with the priest or priestess, and this is supposed to encourage the the God to make your 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 land fertile and to give you good crops the next next year and one of the reasons this religious system was so evil and that god wanted to wipe it out was because the canaanite religion more than any other in the ancient world was extremely syncretistic that means that if you had 10 gods and somebody came along and they were worshiping an 11th god you just brought that into your system and before long, everybody's worshiping this fertility idea because everybody likes sex a lot. And so this appeals to their basest, uh, the basis aspects of their sin nature, and it becomes extremely evil. And the, uh, the altars would just run red with the blood of slaughtered babies. And this happened again and again. And this is why God says to Abraham, their evil hasn't come to, it hasn't been filled yet. But when they do, then I will completely remove them. This is why God authorized a complete uh, annihilation of every man, woman, and child in the Canaanite culture is so that it would not infect and destroy all of humanity with their religious system. And so part of their religious rites was this emphasis on trees, either as symbolic representations of life and fertility or as a site for worship. And so this has its ultimate origin going back to the tree of life in the, in the Garden of Eden. S- sacred trees became a central part of the fertility cult of Asherah. And it's often referred to as the Asherah pole. And so uh, it's, it's talked about in the prophets. For example, in Hosea 4.13, 4, talks about how the Israelites have succumbed to this perversion. And Hosea says they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops. The reason they go to the mountaintop 
is because this idea, although Genesis doesn't make mention a hill or a mountain in, in uh, Eden, that was the idea. There is a mountain mentioned, the mountain of God in Ezekiel 28. And they burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths. So they are worshiping in these groves. And what they're doing is they're having orgies up there because all of this uh, sexual activity is what's going to uh, convince the gods to bring them prosperity. Uh, Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry and your brides commit adultery. It's not just talking about that literally, but it is a, it's, uh, they're unfaithful to the God of the covenant with, with Israel. They are uh, violating that covenant. Second Kings 17.10 says they set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. Now what we ought to be thinking about when we think about this perversion of worship is how do Christians pervert worship today? Because we do, we're not any different from any other generation. You go back and you study different things in the Middle Ages and you realize that as you get past the 7th and 8th century and the, the missionaries were going out from what by then had become uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church and they would go into new areas, for example, into Scandinavia and they would discover the various uh, gods and goddesses that, that uh, controlled Uh, everything from health to good luck to uh, agriculture and whatever. And they would just take the the names of those uh, deities and they would modify them and make them saints. And you would pray to those saints and they would give you good luck or help you find things or uh, give you... uh, uh, a good crops, things of that nature. It was assimilation. It was the same thing that was going on in the in the ancient world, and we see similarities to that uh, today. As people in many many churches now have a view of worship that isn't distinct from the culture around them. They, ha- they, they specifically talk about this. You read the church growth literature, and it talks about we need to have the same kind of music in church that they have when they go to a rock concert or when they're listening to the radio so they don't feel uncomfortable coming to church. Well, I think from Scripture, we, should be un- we see that people come into the presence of God and they hear the truth of God. It makes them uncomfortable. And so this is a violation and, and you see many churches, you see Bible churches, there's, there's about five or six Bible churches I know of in Houston that still stick to good, solid uh, musicology on Sunday morning. And we're called dinosaurs. And all the big ones that were the basic, basic sources for good Bible teaching 30, 40, or 50 years ago have all apostatized in the area of worship and music. And I'll tell them that, you're an apostate. You've bought into a pagan view of music. And you don't want to think about it because if you think about it and teach about it, then you'll lose half your people because they don't want to feel too distinct or too set apart from the culture around them because they want to be able to blend in and have a good time and, and not be thought of as strange or weird or legalistic. What happens in the Old Testament is that when the law was discovered, (coughs) <coughs> was rediscovered in 2 Kings 23.4. The king, uh, Josiah, commanded, the, the, commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and all the host of heaven. The host of heaven are all the other gods and goddesses. So they had put all of these altars, all of these idols into the temple into Solomon's temple. And now they've got to cleanse the temple. And that's the same kind of thing that's happening in worship today. People have brought all these pagan ideas and and they don't realize it because we're not taught to think philosophically and critically about what we're doing in church on Sunday morning. And so what, what did they do? They took all this out and they burned it in the in the fields of, uh, of Kidron, in the Kidron Valley, and carried their ashes to Bethel. They cleansed the temple. So we always have to be aware of and fight for 
uh, purity in worship. Uh, these ideas of the truth of God always get perverted. So when we talk about the tree of life, it's not just something that happened back in the Garden of Eden. There wasn't just a tree of life there. This is something that is that is uh, symbolized throughout Scripture, and it also looks forward to, just like everything else we've looked at, something that is in the future, something is in the new heavens and the new earth. In fact, in Revelation 2.7, which is <coughs> the first letter to the seven churches mentioned in Revelation, sort of a report card as I've taught before. It's an evaluation. And then they are warned to that they need to correct certain areas. And they're told that, are, and they're also praised for areas that they're doing well. And then there's always this incentive clause that's put there. And it always runs something like this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if you're really positive, you will respond and you will implement change. And the promise is to the one who overcomes, that is to the believer who presses on and changes and responds to the message, I will give to eat from what? The tree of life. Wait a minute, I thought that was destroyed back in the garden. I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What is that talking about? That's talking about something that is future, something that is restored in the new heavens and the new earth, this a restoration of God's sanctuary, his paradise, and those who are believers who are rewarded at certain levels uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, one of the privileges they will have is to eat from the tree of life in the future, uh, future state. That's mentioned again in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments. That's those who've overcome, those who have obeyed and responded to, to Scripture. That they may have the right to the tree of life. See, this is now talking about the situation, the new heavens and the new earth, and may enter through the gates into the city. So it indicates special privilege uh, that is given, special blessing given to those who have been obedient uh, believers. So the tree of life has a past, it has a future, but it was also part of the worship in the tabernacle and the temple. Just as the pagan religions had a corrupt memory of the importance of trees, God brings into the temple representation of these two trees that had existed in the Garden of Eden. And the first has to do with the golden lampstand, the golden menorah. Uh, in Exodus chapter 25, 31, Moses is told, you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. It was to be made out of one solid piece of gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. Here is a picture of, of the lampstand as it is drawn, manufactured by one artist. We'll come back and look at this a little more in a minute. And six branches shall come out of its side. So you had three on one side and three on the other side. Six branches shall come out of it. The three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond um, blossoms on one branch. So in this, you have this de depiction here, one, two, three. And each one of these stands, here's another picture here, how they uh, present this as the cups. You have one, two, and three. Uh, this depicts it a little differently here, one, two, and three. And over here, they're circular, going around the uh, uh, post itself. So they just represent, because 
Uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting when I was studying uh, what Arnold taught on the tabernacle years ago on me on the temple was he said you have enough detail to replicate it but not precisely. <laughs> you couldn't draw a precise architectural blueprint of the temple with what we're given in scripture but you can get pretty close. So uh, that's why you have these, these uh, different uh, possibilities. So three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond bl blossoms on the other branch. Now I pointed this out a while back. Why almond branches? Because the almond is the first tree to bloom in Israel in the spring. If you've lived up north, you see a forsythia. It's a real garish yellow. It's, it's the first thing that blooms uh, early in the spring and it's just a loud color that, that announces the coming of spring. Well, that's the almond blossom. Once that bloomed, then you knew that it was, it was spring, winter was over. It's a picture of new life. And that is the picture that we have here, the new life, ultimately the new life in Christ. So um, then here are the pictures. We've already looked at those. Verse 31, you shall also I just looked at that. 34, on the lampstand itself, four cups shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental buds and flower. And there shall be a bud under the first two branches of the same, a bud under the second two branches of the same, and a bud under the third two branches of the same. See, God, even though I, I've j just said it's not so precise, you can precisely uh, replicate it, God is pretty precise here as to what should be there. There should be, um, uh, verse 35, there should be a bud under the first, well, I, I just read that. Verse 36, their buds and their branches shall be of one piece, and all of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. No, this is beautiful. This took a lot of craftsmanship. That's why the Holy Spirit uh, in, dwelt and, or, and filled a holy ab in Bezalel because this was way beyond their human ability to do this. It's the Holy Spirit who... Uh, enabled them to do this craftsmanship. So this was to depict the tree of life. Because as we look at the tabernacle itself, the uh, golden lampstand, the menorah is inside the holy place. It is on one side. Opposite it is the table of showbread. What is the menorah doing? It is lit 24-7, and it is illuminating the bread. The bread represents life. And again, we see this combination of these two ideas of life and light, just as we saw with Jesus, that he in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And so we see that the tree represents God's provision of light and life for without light which represents the illumination of God's special revelation there can be no life and without the illumination of God's Messiah there can be no life and in the tabernacle uh, as it the light falls on the bread it illuminates as, as a symbol of God's revelation, it illuminates bread as the source of life, just as God's revelation illuminates Jesus as the bread of life. Notice in John, Jesus is called both the bread of life and the light of life. He is the light of the world. So all of this ultimately points towards, towards Jesus. And then when we think of light, we also think of the fact that the first thing God does as he's preparing the earth for the habitation of man on the first day is he creates light. So it's a reminder that God creates. It's a picture of revelation. God will provide for that revelation. So all of this comes together. It looks back to the garden, it looks forward to Jesus, and ultimately it all comes together when in the new heavens and the new earth, there won't be a need for sun or moon because the triune God will illuminate the entire earth with his glory. 
Then we come to the second tree, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, in the tabernacle, there's not another exact replica of the tree, but we have the concept of good and evil represented in the tabernacle. It's represented by the law of Moses, which is inside the Ark of the Covenant. When we look at what the scripture says, the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may eat freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now what in the world is going on here? God is omniscient. He knows everything. He wants to be the only source of knowledge for the new creature. God is the embodiment of righteousness and justice and goodness. God is good. So he wants to be the exclusive and only source of knowledge of good and evil for man because he alone can properly define it. If man is going to seek some other source for determining good and evil, then it will be a per perverted. It will not be coming from God. Man cannot learn good and evil, the true absolute of good and evil, experientially. You can only learn it from God's revelation. That's why the Mosaic law represented God's law. It defined for Israel what good and evil were. It defined what righteousness was and what unrighteousness is. And so we see that the knowledge of good and evil, like all knowledge, resides in God and must be revealed from God. And man is given a test to see if he will depend upon God alone for the source of knowledge of good and evil or if he will seek to make himself the arbiter, the definer of good and evil. And this was what Satan is tempting. Satan comes along and tempts. He um, implies to Eve, has God really said this? In other words, is this really in your best interest? See, see, God, God's excluding you. You have a brain. You can figure this out. Doesn't this fruit look good? And if you eat from this, then you're going to have the same power that God has to define and determine good and evil. And so that is, that's the offer. You can determine right from wrong. And what the scripture teaches us is that only the creator God can has the exclusive domain for determining what is right and what is wrong. And this is the temptation that we see that runs through Scripture. The offer is for us to have dominion and power and authority apart from God, to determine right from wrong apart from God, to determine what real life consists of apart from God. And so this temptation runs through Scripture. And ultimately the temptation is to tempt them to reject God's authority and to assert their independence or their autonomy from God. See, this is the two basic characteristics of Satan's sins. It's an antagonism to God, and it's the assertion of autonomy, to be independent of God and to not be dependent upon his uh, revelation. And so this failure is depicted in the temple. This, the man, fact that man failed, and so the tablets of the law are placed inside uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Deuteronomy 4, 13 and 14, we're told, He declared to you, this is Moses speaking, God declared to you, the people of Israel, His covenant which He commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and He wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. The point is, God's the only source of the knowledge of truth, right, and wrong. And then in Deuteronomy 10.5, as Moses is 
uh, reiterating what happened on Mount Sinai. It says, Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are just as the Lord commanded me. In Exodus 25, 16, uh, God tells Moses, And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil depicts the authority to determine right from wrong, and that only comes from God's Word. And so uh, man must focus. Our responsibility in worship is to learn from God's Word, and it is the most valuable thing in the world. Think about what the psalmist says, Psalm 19.7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Notice all these different terms that are used to relate to the Torah, to the revelation of God. The law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord are right. See, he determines what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, the illumination of the menorah. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. No matter what we have in this life, what we enjoy, the knowing the word of God should be more desired than anything else that we do. More to be desired are they than gold, than wealth, than health care, whatever you want to put in there. More to be desired are they than anything in this life, any detail of life. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So with that, I'll uh, bring it to a close tonight. We still need to look at, well, I can cover this pretty quickly because there's not a lot here. We have the cherubim who are set to guard over uh, the garden. They're depicted in this drawing that they stand, the, the cherubs, and there were, I don't know, thousands maybe? Depends on how large the whole garden were. An entire uh, army of cherubs that surrounded the garden to prevent humans from re-entering. And they're depicted in the in the tabernacle through the veils that had the cherubs embroidered on those veils to remind man that you could not go into the presence of God anymore. And so this is a representation uh, of that. So we have the trees, the cherub being the image of God. Man is created in the image of God. You go into the pagan temples. They, they remember this. They have an image of the deity in all of their temples. We think of Dagon. You have this idol that's there. That's the image of the deity. You, if you went to Egypt, you would see images of the Pharaoh all over Egypt. Just a reminder that he is God. But who's the image of God? It's man. This is why there's a prohibition against making images of deity in the first commandment. Why? because it destroys the identity and the uniqueness of mankind. It is an attack on humanity to make an image of God because we are the image of God. So the image of God in the Garden of Eden was the priest king who was to keep and to serve in the garden, those terms that are used to describe the work of, of, of a priest. So we are the image of God, and then this was a place of rest. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden. And that's an interesting word there because it's the Hebrew word nuach. It's not the word that's used earlier in Genesis 2 for uh, placing man there, which was simply the idea that we would use for, I'm going to take this and go put it in the kitchen. This is a special word. It indicates rest. It is the place of rest. He is placed in a unique location uh, to serve the Lord. It's used in Isaiah 14.1, talking about the future restoration of Israel to the land. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and restore them from their uh, diaspora. 
and will still choose Israel and what? And place them at rest in the land. See, that's talking about a future time when the nation is regathered from its worldwide dispersion and they will be at rest in the kingdom. Psalm 132, 13, and 14, especially verse 14, God says of Zion, this is my nuach, my resting place. See, this is where God will rest and man will serve him in the kingdom, in his temple. Jesus uses this concept in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is then picked up by the writer of Hebrews to remind Christians today that there is a future rest. It's the millennial kingdom. There remains a Sabbath rest. It's that seventh day. It is a rest. It's, I believe it may be the 7,000th uh, year, the seventh millennium. I uh, can't say that for absolute, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, Hebrews 4.10, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also arrested from his work. And that word for rest is to enter into the rest of God in the millennial kingdom. Let us be diligent to enter that rest, that is be diligent in our spiritual growth in preparation for the judgment seat of Christ so that we will enter into it with all of the glory for God that we should. So that brings that together, and next time we'll look at what happens as the serpent appears in the garden and how that is reflected down through the, uh, down through the pagan religions and what happens when the sanctuaries, when man is prevented from entering the sanctuary, how is God going to create a plan and a response so that that sanctuary is eventually restored in a more glorious way at the new heavens and the new earth. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to be reminded of your plan and your purpose, taking us from corruption to incorruption, taking us from a fallen world to a redeemed creation where we live forever in a world untainted by sin and corruption, serving you as we were originally created and designed to do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.